All right. Well, um, I hope you enjoyed those three talks. And now we have time for about a 20 minute discussion. So for everybody listening out there, um, please uh, send in your questions if you have them. You can use the Q&A uh, box to write them in and then we will get them and we'll try to address as many of them as we can. We already have a number. So let me perhaps um, uh, start um, and go to uh, um, uh, maybe Lorenz, I'll start with you. Do we understand with either pharmacologic uh, intensification or focal interventional treatment, what the mechanism is of perhaps um, stabilizing the plaque? Is it mainly thickening the cap? Is it delipidation? That is reducing the size of the necrotic core? Is it uh, reducing local or focal inflammation? What, or is it all of the above? What do you think is going on here? Well, thank, thank you very much, Craig. I think uh, you, you already named it. Um, what can be improved, and we have the best evidence, as I already uh, mentioned in my talk uh, on statin treatment, is that we can, first of all, thicken the cap. The magnitude in a patient receiving high intensity statin therapy is about um, 50 to 100 micrometer within a year of treatment. So far, the evidence today. In addition, the plaque burden can be reduced, but I think most of you would agree that the magnitude of the effect was a little bit under the expectation. Between, uh, as you could see, the um, average PAV reduction is only about 1%. It is a very, very consistent value. It can, is highly reproducible in any high intensity statin therapy. It was about 1%, which is not so much. And uh, make me not really believe that this is the major change in that you can achieve with uh, LDL lowering therapy. So probably the cap thickening is more substantial. On top of that, and as you mentioned, macrophage can really substantially be reduced. That was shown in the EasyFit RCT trial that you also have um, mentioned in your slides. We did a study where we looked at this and we could show a 30 to 40% macrophage reduction within only a year. And there are sometimes very impressive findings where mm -hmm. the coronary was full of macrophages and completely cleaned up. So this is probably the most early effect that you can have on atherosclerosis. Great, thank you. Uh, now let me go to David. Um, David, we talked mostly about invasive techniques today to identify vulnerable plaque. And it, it seems that there are two main ways that these patients can come to us. One is they might be on our cath lab table for some other reason. And then when we happen to be using an intravascular imaging catheter, whether or not we're looking for these vulnerable plaques, we may be finding them. But, you know, it, it begs the question that the most valuable um, uh, way to identify vulnerable plaque would be in the walking well. Those patients who are not being treated with maximal statins and guideline directed therapies, uh, who don't even necessarily know that they have coronary artery disease. Um, but we know that we're having hundreds of thousands of people every year, both in Europe and the United States, who are having new myocardial infarctions and sudden cardiac death. So tell us a little bit about uh, your thoughts about screening. I know there have been, uh, you've been involved in large studies in Sweden in particular that have been involved with uh, um, CT screening such as SCAPIS. Um, how good is CT angiography or other techniques as a screen for vulnerable plaque and what do you recommend today? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. It's a very important question. We, as you mentioned, we have done a CT angio screening of uh, healthy people 50 to 65 years old in the SCAPIS trial. We examined 30,000 patients, so quite a lot of patients. Uh, and it turns out that when you take, the, you take patients that have not had any cardiovascular disease before, then you have 42% of those patients has some sort of a plaque in their coronaries, either a stenosis or a, a plaque burden uh, you know, a, a, a soft plaque that you can see on the CT angle. So actually, 
all our mid-age people in uh, the, the rich world uh, go around with uh, half of them, 40%, have some sort of plaque. So how should we examine them? Uh, CT is very good at taking away those that have no disease. So that's a good way. 60% does not need any more examining. Um, we need some characteristics for the vulnerable plaques, maybe some requirement of some sort of stenosis, and then uh, maybe some other factors, lifestyle changing factors, maybe some blood tests that can help us in the future. And then we could take them to the cat lab and do um, intracoronary imaging and really uh, find if they have a vulnerable plaque that in the future may need treatment. So today, if you've got a patient who's got atypical chest pain, so you do a CT scan and uh, um, uh, he's got, uh, uh, he or she's got, uh, you know, mild to moderate atherosclerosis, uh, but, uh, you know, maybe a stress test is negative, but you saw in that CT one or two plaques that have um, positive remodeling with low attenuation plaques, maybe there's a napkin ring sign, et cetera, all the classic uh, features. What would you do differently today with that patient? Would you tell them something about their prognosis? Would you put them on more intense medical therapy? Or do we need, you know, again, randomized trials to say that we should be reacting to those types of um, findings? Yeah, so we actually had a, a, a several patients that came from the Scopis to the cat lab, and I did Ivis Nears on several of them. And sometimes I found a plaque in the proximal LED with a lot of lipid. I mean, max LCBI of 600 or something like that. And then I got really, really worried. And um, at that time, I just put them on statins. Now after prospect two, uh, I would nearly like to stent them actually. Uh, but as you said before, we need large randomized clinical trials to, to know what we are doing. But it's really uncomfortable to send a patient home with what we call a widow maker, a lipidish plaque in proximal LED, for example. I think if I might add a thought, uh, currently the European guidelines for lipid lowering uh, suggest that a patient that has two uh, lesions uh, with a, a person uh, diameter stenosis of more than 50, they should be categorized as very high risk and accordingly the LDL should be lower than 1.4 millivolt per liter. And I really strongly propose that we should go beyond the person diameter stenosis also in the guidelines in, and clearly integrate vulnerability characteristics as assessed by CT because obviously most of our patients uh, get CT. So I really believe it's a very, very important risk stratifier and we need to act if we find those uh, changes in the CCTA. But this, of course, also requires that the reports of our radiologists or cardiologists who do CCTA are adapted accordingly. But to me, the present evidence from, as for example, Scott Hart, are uh, good enough to justify a treatment intensification. Well, but so, but, but let me challenge you a little bit on that, because again, what those recommendations are based on is just atherosclerosis right? As you mentioned, the severity of stenosis, the number of plaques, et cetera. They're not recommending that you um, differentiate according to the type of plaque. Uh, and so it's, again, I was going to ask you about pharmacologic intensification. Um, you know, obviously right now we're looking at risk factors. Um, we're looking, some people would measure CRP to look for systemic inflammation and you've got some soft guidelines, and I would call them soft because of the where we are with randomized trials, suggesting that perhaps we should do more potent lipid lowering therapy with more severe stenosis, okay? But what about vulnerable plaque characteristics? Do we have enough evidence, for example, you take my patient, the patient that I showed you that has two 20% stenosis, but they are vulnerable plaques by what we understand from um, uh, the nears ivus, we know that those lesions now are at increased risk for both LRP and from prospect two. But based on that, let's say that patient's got an LDL of 75 on 80 milligrams of atorvastatin. Would you then start a, um, a relatively expensive PCSK9 inhibitor or do we need 
more randomized trial evidence. Lorenz, what would you do for that patient? For that patient, I uh, first of all would uh, assess uh, his inflammatory activity. So I would also uh, measure high sensitivity CRP because that would uh, open a new avenue. Uh, and we do have uh, relatively cheap drugs now available as for example, colchicine that could be considered. I would start this patient, if he has evidence of a vulnerable plaque in the CT clearly, uh, on a statin and probably do a follow-up and evaluate the evolution of his plaque after one or two years. And if he's not responsive at all, I would consider to, uh, to uh, add on another therapy. If he is uh, a patient with high inflammatory activity and anti-inflammatory drug. All right, so that patient uh, has a CRP uh, of three. Obviously, we talk about uh, a prognostically important location in the coronary tree, left right. in proximal localization. I'm not talking about the distal, uh, distally located vulnerable plaque, but if it's, if, it's, if it's the proximal LAD and you have clear vulnerability cri criteria and the CCTA, you have to do something on top of the regular OMT. So, so that patient that I showed you has, we'll, we'll say he didn't have a CRP measured to my knowledge, but say he did, and it was three. And uh, he already was on a torvastatin and he already on a torvastatin, 80 milligrams a day, had an LDL of 75 milligrams per deciliter. So pretty well controlled, but it could be lower. Okay, so would you put that patient on a PCSK9 inhibitor? If he's on 70, um, on if his, if his LDL is 70 and he has already a torvastatin in 40. Right, uh, 80. And right. Yes, uh, well, again, it will depend, uh, of course, uh, whether other risk factors exist, if he's smoking, if he's hypertensive, right. et cetera. If nothing at all exists and it will be paid for, I would put him on PCS can I need for sure. Yeah, so. Uh, the problem is reimbursement, obviously. But um, patients tolerate very low LDL values, and we know the lower we get, the more atherogression we observe. PCSK9 inhibitors are so much well tolerated that I really would have a very low threshold um, to right. put my patients on, on such an antibody. So again, we'll just acknowledge that there are no guidelines yet that recommend that, and there are no randomized trials yet that recommend that but I think we're thinking forward looking as to what we believe it would be a very strong hypothesis. Sure. That such an approach would be reasonable. Uh, so uh, let me ask you similarly, uh, you did show a, a slide or two about colchicine, um, very interesting drug, but it seems that it's use either post MI or in vulnerable plaque it right now seems very low, um, despite the fact that it's an inexpensive drug and the data has now gotten pretty strong from three randomized trials. Um, should we be using more colchicine? Clearly. Uh, to me, the situation is relatively clear. We have two large scale trials. The results are robust, consistent. The key problem is that one fifth of a patient will not tolerate the drug, which requires regular follow up. Uh, of the patients. But to me, um, the reason probably that the use is so low might be the tolerability and that there is no um, company pushing uh, it behind. But uh, for me, it's a reasonable alternative for patients at high risk for uh, uh, disease progression. If, 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 if they have a high inflammatory risk. So probably I would see my patient uh, four weeks, eight weeks after the, the ACS, measured high sensitivity CRP. If he has a, a high risk for progression, I would consider uh, to add 0.5 colchicine a day, clearly, because no cost. And uh, if he tolerates it throughout the first weeks, it will be a good add-on. All right, so let's address some more of the questions from the audience. Some of these I can answer quickly. Um, one was about remodeling ratios that uh, um, a questioner asked that a plaque remodeling greater than 1.3 tends to be strongly associated with acute events and plaque rupture. Um, have you looked at this in your studies? And I can tell you, we did look at it in uh, prospect one and interestingly, remodeling just as a continuous variable was not related to adverse events in prospect one. But when we looked at it in more detail, we actually found a U-shaped curve in that both positive remodeled plaques were at increased risk and then plaques that were not remodeled um, at all were not, but negatively remodeled plaques 
we're also at increased risk. So you have some vessels that are actually, you know, you have adventitial constriction and they show negative remodeling. So we actually found this interesting U-shaped curve. That being said, even the positive remodeling um, uh, correlated strongly with plaque burden um, in a multivariable model, plaque burden was more important than the um, positive remodeling. My, my, my... I might just have a practical uh, comment. Of course, uh, to assess the remodeling in the cath lab is a bit more challenging than looking at the black burden or the uh, LCBI. Yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, um, depends how you can make it very complex or you can make it easy, though, depending on if you just measure a ratio of the maximum to the minimum um, vessel diameter according to the reference. But I agree with you. Another question um, from one of the viewers asks um, that there's data showing that uh, plaque characteristics, especially necrotic core, are correlated with FFR. So would greater FFR use have changed the results of ischemia? Uh, Why well, was one of the principal investigators with ischemia? So I can address that one. We actually did um, strongly recommend that uh, FFR or IFR be used in ischemia for borderline lesions, any lesions that were 40 to 80%. We haven't done yet the detailed analysis as to how frequently that was done and the effect that that might have had um, on the trial, but that was a strong recommendation. Uh, but it brings up the more general question. Um, uh, if you look at all the trials that have looked at ischemia, Okay, there does seem to be a relationship, you know, 10,000, 15,000 patients, the greater the rates of ischemia, the greater the rates of cardiac death and myocardial infarction. I think that holds with stress echo, with nuclear studies, uh, PET studies, there have been very large studies that have shown that. But so people ask, well, why is that? Why, why should five minutes of ischemia, right, or three minutes of ischemia uh, be strongly associated with myocardial infarction and, and sudden death? Well, actually, what it is, is that when you have ischemia producing lesions, they are larger plaque burden lesions, and they also have an increased number of high risk plaque characteristics. So I believe pretty strongly that it's not the ischemia that's killing anybody, while it may increase wall stress, and that can also obviously um, uh, provoke thrombosis, but it's really the company that it keeps. Uh, that uh, you usually are getting more high risk characteristics. Now, the problem is in ischemia, of course, we identified those lesions and those were all the lesions that we were fixing. But the majority of those lesions, just because you have ischemia doesn't mean you have high risk characteristics. The majority of them are just garden variety pathologic intimal thickening or fibrocalcific disease. And we don't prevent deaths and myocardial infarctions from treating those lesions. We do if we treat those ischemia producing lesions that are vulnerable plaques, presumably, but we're leaving a lot behind that are mild and non-flow limiting that we are not assessing. And FFR won't identify, IFR won't identify, and we're not even, most people are not even thinking about those lesions today, uh, absent data. David, any other thoughts on that topic? No, I think, um, I mean, FFR and, and uh, IFR are great. And uh, overall, there will be an association with high risk plaques and uh, a more severe stenosis that cause ischemia. I think for the future, the interesting thing would be the borderline um, um, measurements we get in from FFR and IFR. I mean, we, we get a lot of those patients now because we have learned to predict what the FFR and IFR would be, learning that long LED lesions are usually positive and short by, and side branches are negative and so on. Um, so we get a lot of borderline results. And I think that's where we should put in our catheters, OCT or Ives Nears. I think Ives Nears is the best, but it's not available everywhere. And, and then we can learn some of the significant but borderline results are stable plaques. We can leave them. We can treat them with medication, anti-angina medication. And some of the negative borderline results will have a large lip-rich plaque, which is dangerous and can kill the patient. And those should be treated some way. We need more information on how, but in the future we will need that, do that. So, so thank you, David. So we're at the bottom of the, uh, of the half hour. So uh, uh, I think it's time to close because we just got a question in saying, uh, how many CME credits is this webinar? 
So I think that shows an audience member is ready to say, okay, that's enough about vulnerable plaque for today. Uh, so if, if I were to summarize, I think it's, it's very clear now that we have techniques that are able to identify non-flow limiting vulnerable plaques. Those plaques that place that specific plaque as well as patients at risk for future major adverse cardiovascular events. Those events can be cardiac death, myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, or just plaque rupture with rapid lesion progression of the plaque, which then can lead to increased angina. Um, and many of those episodes will also be asymptomatic. We've got very strong data. Um, probably the strongest data right now is for uh, both virtual histology, that is radio frequency IVIS, which is a technique that, as David mentioned, is not being used because of the difficulty in pattern recognition. Uh, but we have very, very strong data now from two large prospective studies with NEARS, that is near infrared spectroscopy, uh, with a combination NEARS IVIS catheter, where we can identify high risk characteristics. We also have good data um, for OCT, looking at fibers cap thickness, lipid arc, macrophage infiltration, et cetera, as uh, predictors of future adverse events. Um, and then we've got non-invasive techniques um, with CTA taking the lead that can screen for vulnerable plaque. The real question uh, comes, what should we do about these when we see them? Um, we've got great evidence that has correlated pharmacologic changes with intense lipid lowering um, and anti-inflammatory therapy with stabilization of the morphologic characteristics of the vulnerable plaque. No major outcomes trials yet though, which is targeting vulnerable plaque characteristics in coronary arteries for pharmacologic intensification. We also have uh, some exciting provocative data that uh, focal therapy with a stent or a scaffold can create a neocap and that is turn a thin cap fibroatheroma into a thick cap fibroatheroma that we can safely enlarge lumens out to two years and that we uh, may be able to reduce lesion related uh, major adverse cardiovascular events. But again, we must await large outcomes trials before we uh, uh, can make any firm recommendations uh, as to whether or not we should, again, I think in general, routinely use pharmaco intense pharmacotherapy um, or focal um, a stent or scaffold treatment of vulnerable plaques. But I think what we've done for you today is identify where I think the future is. We've got to start thinking like this, looking beyond the angiogram, looking beyond ischemia, if we're going to be able to identify patients at risk for future myocardial infarction, ACS, and sudden cardiac death, and then come up with preventative therapies to improve overall societal prognosis. So I want to thank um, uh, my um, two partners in the symposium uh, tremendously, uh, David Erlinga um, and Lorenz Robber. Uh, your talks and comments were fantastic. We hope to see you in the future for um, additional webinars. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.